Well, we can go ahead and uh, and at least start the conversation. Um, this is going to get recorded, so we're going to make this available for everybody. Uh, we'll likely put this on our YouTube channel as well, uh, so that way everybody gets a chance to hop in here and uh, you know kind of review everything that we talked about today. Uh, I'm just going to go ahead and share my screen. I put together a really um, really simple couple slides um, uh, just together to kind of talk through. So. This webinar that we're doing today is um, part of um, some feedback that we got from a show that we did back in January. Uh, myself and Jim, uh, the founders of Render, uh, we were at Job Trade Connect down in Dallas. And I spoke about uh, the implications of growing or modeling business and all of the things that you have to consider when doing so. And I touched very horizontally on a lot of topics from marketing uh, improve, process improvements to sales, business development, and production, uh, putting systems in place to kind of help us get to that next phase. Got a lot of feedback from the show. A lot of people wanted to learn more uh, and dive deeper. So that's why we decided to kind of go in and, and grab a couple partners in the industry that know a lot about, uh, you know, we'll call them subject matter experts that can weigh in with their expertise. Um, so this is uh, the first of three uh, webinars that we're doing. Today's is about production. I'm going to introduce Tim here in a minute. Uh, next week, we are doing one on marketing, uh, answering a lot of those high-profile questions about where to even start with marketing. There's uh, a myriad of different things we can uh, talk about there. And then, of course, we have one uh, just a couple weeks after, uh, the week after the IBS show, uh, with Eric Fortenberry from JobTread to talk about sales and uh, business development. Obviously, we're open to additional suggestions. If you guys like this webinar and want to do more and have other suggestions, I'm happy to connect and get some of these uh, going for further education. Um, just a little bit about me in case uh, you weren't at the Job Trek Connect show or we haven't bumped into each other. I own Cornerstone Remodeling, started it in 2011. We're now up to a team of 21. Um, we are design build focused on kitchens and bathrooms uh, here in Maryland. Uh, revenue last year, just around $8 million. Uh, we're trying to shoot for 10, but kind of pacing ourselves to get there. Mm -hmm. um, biggest accomplishment with Cornerstone is that we are doing $8 million and I might have a five to eight hour weekly commitment in that company right now, which has been, uh, like I said, my biggest accomplishment there. Uh, and the reason why is that uh, we founded Render in 2021. Uh, we launched product in 2023. It's a sales acceleration platform for the home improvement industry. So we're helping contractors find a lot more sales success uh, with uh, faster, more speedy estimates and designs and so on. Um, more about that later. But today we have a special guest, Tim Fowler. Um, I imagine that most people coming to this podcast have heard your name, Tim. Uh, you're you're quite the uh, <laughs> quite the guy in the industry. Um, so I pulled this off of your website. We kind of talked about this before we launched uh, the the webinar live for everybody. But uh, 17 years is uh, not accurate. I pulled this from your website, so it needs updating. Uh, yeah. can, you, can you basically introduce yourself, how long you've been at this, and what you specifically do uh, for remodeling company business owners like myself? Sure. So um, I, I've actually been in the industry 41 years. I started in a small town in South Georgia and then migrated back to the Washington, D.C. area but I've been doing the consulting training side of it for 23 years. Uh, and so basically I'm a production champion. You know, if I'm, if I get to go to a company, I'm looking out for what's going to help production do a great job. Now that typically starts before the so jobs actually signed by the client. And of course goes all the way through till warranty is done uh, at whatever time frame. And so I have uh, a lot of questions I like to ask companies. What are you doing with this, 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 and this? And then typically I do training. I think my my strength really is that I I can connect with almost everybody, whether it's a business owner or a salesperson or designer, or more importantly, lead carpenters and project managers. And we understand the challenges that we go through and I can connect with them in a way that helps them understand maybe how to make things a little bit better. It really does mean a lot when you're talking, getting advice from, or just seeking like, uh, like having a sounding board with someone yeah. who understands the pain points. 
I mean, that's really what we see as our benefit uh, being, you know, uh, C, uh, software CEOs, right, in the uh, in the software space. Getting into the home improvement uh, sector, nobody trusts anybody unless you've got the experience swinging the hammer, been in the field, you know what it's like to shovel mud out of a footer for an inspection at 730 in the morning in the middle of July, you know, like having that experience coming to the table saying, hey, I, I see you, I've been there before, here's how I would tackle that. You know, it, it comes uh, it comes from a, a better place when it comes with that experience. So I appreciate you kind of, you know, leveraging that experience to kind of help business owners like myself climb to that next step, um, kind of see around corners and know how to navigate <laughs> a lot of those issues. So I appreciate you being here, uh, Tim. Well, thank you. So with that being said, um, so this is basically going to sit here on the screen just to kind of help guide the conversation. Um, I'm going to open this up. Um, I'll, I'll kind of start some conversation here in a second, but just anybody uh, who is live here listening, uh, if you have questions about anything we're talking about, uh, feel free to drop the questions here in the chat. We will catch these as they come up and we'll, uh, if we get a bunch of them, we'll kind of sift through and, and ask, or sorry, answer those uh, kind of live here between uh, Tim and myself. Um, but yeah, just kick the conversation off, Tim. Uh, we, I was listening to your podcast actually just yesterday, which teased this conversation up perfectly. You were talking uh, with someone about, um, what was it, capacity beyond demand, right? Yep, yep. And one of the things that you guys started by talking, started talking about was when the sales team sells a ton of work, right? Right. The natural, uh, the natural response from a business owner or a production manager is to say, I'm just going to ask my PMs and my lead carpenters, can you just fit a little, can you get one more job in? Can you do right. one more for us? So uh, let's kind of open this up a little bit. Uh, let's, let's assume that a lot of people joining this uh, webinar today and that will be listening have remodeling businesses, whether they're, you know, a million and a half, three million, six, 12 million. They want to go to that next step. So for the contractor out there doing a million and a half in business that says, I want to go to three, what are the anticipated challenges that um, that I know that I saw on mine? I can speak from experience, but what, do you, what are some of the anticipated challenges or the most prominent ones that you would say to make sure they have a good handle on before embarking on that growth journey? Well, probably it's no big surprise to anybody out there that probably the labor challenge is the challenge now. Um, but not just finding the people, but it's getting the people that will actually be able to execute the work in a way that we want it executed. And so I've been talking over the last couple of years about how years ago, when I first started in this business, the question was always asked, like, who, who's the first person that a contractor should hire? And it was always an office manager or a bookkeeper, right? And so I have shifted the discussion in my mind to maybe human resource is the most important person or role within a company. It may not be, may not be big enough to have a human resource department, but somebody in a business has to be focused every single day on human resource. Otherwise, we're always playing catch up. So we're selling and then, woo, we just sold a $200,000 project. We've got no one to produce it. We've got to hire somebody. And then they come in without any training or onboarding or familiarity with the company. And then we end up with, with trouble. And so- yeah. A lot of problems with that because yeah, you're bringing somebody in trying to onboard a new employee or a new subcontractor in the midst of having a lot of stuff going on. So yeah. not anticipating that hire can be extremely detrimental. I, I love it. so if if a company's not big enough for a dedicated HR person, who does that who, who does that role typically fall to? I mean, I imagine the owner uh, for the most part, right? But I mean, would you suggest that it's anybody else in the company? Well, I'm a big, big team fan. And uh, when I go into a company and I'm working with them and I'll ask a question like, who's responsible for hiring lead carpenters? And everybody will look at the production manager. And I go like, no, uh -uh. it's this whole company, the owner, the office manager, the estimator, all the lead carpenters, the product, you know, everybody has to be 
looking out into the world around them and seeing the potential in people and and inviting them to be part of this great uh, business that we're part of. And so typically the business owner is the final say, but I would, I'd just make it top of mind for everybody. How do we improve our team? How do we keep hiring? The other thing I want to emphasize is that we are, we need to be in the always hiring mode. And I, I just, a couple of weeks ago, I'm talking with a business owner that I actually referred somebody to and they said, well, we don't have a job for him, but we hired him anyway. And they're going to, um, because they needed that position for three months down the road. So they got him on board. They know they're going to grow. And then they're going to be able to move him right into the position that he was hired for. And so it's a, it's a long-term, it's a long look ahead. It's a lead item, if you will. It's kind of like, appliances nowadays you know we got to wait <laughs> three or four months yeah. for the refrigerator maybe we're hiring and then we're training and onboarding so that they're ready to go one once of the we biggest that position one of the biggest mindset shifts that i had going from that two million dollar glass ceiling and beyond was getting out of my own head thinking of hiring practices like the old way was like i'll hire somebody when i need somebody right you're in tune with your company when you're doing a million and a half, two million, you, you know, the everyday stuff that's going on. But as you grow, you're being removed from a lot of those, uh, you know, daily, you know, task oriented things. And uh, we, we made a shift. We, we said, okay, look, when you go to a grocery store, you go to home Depot, there's always a sign that says now hiring always, right. they always have it up. It's always posted because right. they're big enough to where they know that they're always going to need someone. Right. And we made that change back, uh, gosh, it was 2021 uh, when we actually did that. And we we said, yeah. we're always hiring. We have a careers page on our website. There's always open positions. You know, if if we come across a really good resume, right, we will hire that person regardless. Because you know what? I need this person on my team. When I need this person and I go looking for them, it's going to be impossible to find somebody like with this resume. It just never happens that way. Actually, so, one of the we just so I'm not a biz I'm not a business coach, but I think in many cases, business owners are thinking, well, let's see what happens. In other words, we're going to try to do three million this year, but we don't know how to make it happen, and so we're waiting to see: are we gonna Are we gonna hit that? Are we gonna hit that? And by the time we really know we're going to hit it, it's too late to hire. And mm -hmm. so part of this process is getting your marketing, all of that chain that's required to do that amount of work in line and make it happen. Anybody that listens to my podcast know I hate the phrase, it is what it is, right? And so if we make the sales happen, then we can anticipate the growth in production and be ready for it. That's a that's a huge thing as far as um, uh, optimizing resources, planning ahead, uh, documentation. How do you handle swells in your uh, it, your sales team? Just sells like uh, has a crazy <laughs> quarter. Uh, how like you can anticipate that? You know how do you how do you manage those jobs in your calendar? Do you push them all out further? Do you try to stack them all in? Do you have the resources to even pull that off? Uh, one of the Christian, uh, questions that we just got from Krista was, where do you find good resumes? <laughs> All right. That's a million dollar question because labor is very tough. I mean, it sounds almost cliche at this point to say, you know, the, you know, labor market is, is, is tough right now, but yeah. do you have, I, I know where we find them. Uh, do you have any suggestions on where to look for good resumes? I'm assuming for in-house staff, but let's just assume in-house or even trade partners at this point. Yeah. I mean, I would, my general reaction is uh, the best thing, the best thing you can do is rely on the word of mouth opportunities that you have. And this is where I've seen the best hiring for trades, for uh, skilled craftsmen, skilled workers. Now, when you're talking about a production manager or maybe an estimator or a bookkeeper, that's a, a little bit of a different different world. But talking to your employees, talking to your trade contractors, talking to your clients who may have hired uh, somebody to do a little bit of work, you know, 
uh, a little bit of pickup work for them. Um, what I've seen, and and if you listen to my podcast, we did a, ser- a whole series with uh, emphasizing how women can be brought into this trade. And one of them, one of the women that we met as a carpenter was met by the boss's wife at a softball game, just sitting on the bleachers. And they got to talking and the boss's wife says, what do you do? And she said, well, I'm a, you know, I think an interior designer or decorator or something like that. And the, and the wife goes, well, have you ever thought about being a carpenter? And boom, love that. now they had a, a great lead carpenter that um, was just from this. And so he, I heard one time somebody hired their the barista out of the coffee shop into their company and they had to train them to become what they wanted them to be, but they found the right people for them. Yeah, one of the other follow-up questions uh, from Chris uh, uh, was, what about trade schools? So this is one thing I was going to actually mention. So um, word of mouth, I think, is great for uh, you know finding uh, good help, uh, especially if you have team members that have friends or uh, colleagues. Yeah. Hiring, uh, getting into conversations with people, just in general, just you know, being a being a warm human being at a at a grocery store, like you said, a barista, something like that. Right. Uh, having conversations, uh, we we have success on Indeed. Uh, it's probably the one place that you know we can find good resumes. I will say, warning, you will go through a hundred resumes before right. you find maybe two or three that you even want to interview. And good luck actually getting them to answer the phone when you call them to set up those interviews. It is excruciating. Yeah. Uh, we have found some good ones there. To answer this question, uh, Krista, I appreciate it. These are two good ones. Um, so uh, trade schools, we have a partnership with, uh, or I wouldn't say any, even a partnership with a trade school. We're uh, good friends with the uh, director of uh, a trade school near us. And we actually have gotten uh, a few really good employees f- straight out of the trade school. They they can usually pinpoint you you will want to talk with like a director or so on um, at a trade school that uh, can kind of steer particular individuals that go there uh, that some want to do welding some want to do electrical some want to right. do commercial but if you have anybody who says hey i really don't like those things i really want to be in residential remodeling uh, we get a call and says hey uh we have somebody who's interested in residential remodeling do you want to hire you know a, a carpenter we're like yes please send them because they're yeah. intentional at that point you know if they're paying for a trade school they want to do this for a living so yeah so tony mentioned in the question and answer box that zephyr connect uh is uh, one of the companies that remodelers advantage works with when we hire people and i'm hearing really good things and he's mentioning that that's a really good source you know, if we've got three or four hours, I can talk to you all about, you know, trade schools. And one of one of the best examples is the state of Wisconsin has an active apprenticeship program. It's a legal apprenticeship program. And a, a couple of the companies that I'm familiar with there hire apprentices while they're still in high school. And then guess what, folks? They stay. They yeah. train them at basically at the expense of the state. And then they stay as carpenters, you know, and so a company, it's an active program, two or three uh, apprentices ongoing. It's a it's a rotating thing. And so they just keep growing internally with their skilled help that way. It's it's really great. I mean, a lot of trade schools that you find uh, do actually have state backing. And when they do, they have to meet certain compliance, right. uh, you know, uh, regulations, I guess, uh, for state funding. So uh, they have pretty rigorous programs. Um, you know, they require a lot out of the trade school attendees as well, like night classes. Uh, we just hired another one uh, just last, or his first day was yesterday, actually, uh, coming out of high school. He's a senior yeah. this year and uh, part of a uh, trade school program with the local community college. Part of the program for him to graduate is uh, to get an internship with a company. And we were that vessel for him. Of course, we're paying him salary. Right. Yeah. Um, you know, but ultimately we're helping him kind of get to that next level while, you know, we're getting, you know, young, we call it young blood, you know, we're getting, <laughs> we're getting some really intentional, uh, you know, young entrepreneurial type of individuals that are coming in, really wanting to learn and uh, get that first job. So yeah, Jim, uh, Jim Sparks here says again, uh, you know, smart to be smart to be in contact with trade school. Uh, yeah. so definitely second and third that um, uh, Jim Baker uh, just 
uh, messaged in. I was a former national director for workforce development of associated builders and contractors, and they have a great apprenticeship pro apprenticeship programs and can be a good resource. So yep. um, anybody listening to this, we'll, we'll probably go through a lot of these chats and mm-hmm. any recommendations that are here. We'll, we'll make sure everybody gets the follow-ups for, for some of these suggestions. These are really good, uh, really good suggestions here. So, so one of the other things, AJ, that's happened in the industry, when I, when I first got into, bef- after I was in for myself, I was actually working for somebody. Lead Carpenter System was kind of the big deal for remodelers. And one of the big shifts has been the development of the trade contractor, contractor relationship. And I'm what I see in my work with companies all over the country is you may start with like in-house carpenter or two, but as you grow, you are almost always gonna have to have trade contractors to do your carpentry as well as your electrical and your plumbing. And the the big companies that I deal with, very few of them have all in-house carpenters. Most of them have trade contractors that are doing the carpentry and they might have a little bit of fill-in, like one or two carpenters that just fill in where the trades are not, um, you know, either contracted to do or something like, but anyway, so the idea is that you can expand without having to hire your base within the company by adding good trade contractors. Now I know some people are, ah, you know, I don't want to give up control, but if you find the right people and it will depend a lot on, your geographic areas to how many people are available and that sort of thing. But once you find the right people and set up the process so that they can succeed, that that is a way that you can control that workforce a little bit for ebbs and flows in your sales process, but also ramp up really fast if you need to, to actually get some projects done. So more of that project manager with a with trade base doing most of the work is a way that many companies have moved into you know five six seven eight ten million dollar range yeah uh we experienced the same thing at cornerstone we were all in-house uh, when i say all in-house we did have specialty trades that we uh, right. contracted electricians and plumbers but ultimately we all in-house were doing all of the demo the framing uh, all the carpentry stuff, even like drywall, um, all the trim out and things like that. And um, one of my biggest things right now is expanding the roster. We have to expand the roster right. because uh, and, and companies that want to grow from a million and a half, to, uh, two million up to that three, four, five, six. Right. You don't yeah. have to do it all at once. You don't have to scrap your in-house team. Um, one thing that we focused on were uh we did disc assessments. I have an example here in this, uh, <laughs> this deck if we want to get into it, but we did disc assessments on all of our employees. We really honed in on the ones, our lead carpenters, our site supervisors, uh, whatever you call them, to figure out who had the ability to manage a team well. We looked at um, uh, different things from experience, uh, what they were exposed to, uh, you know, from a complexity level on jobs down to how they treat other people. Uh, you know, are they good managers of people? Can they juggle tasks? Are they, um, you know, multifaceted? Can they absorb constant hits from homeowners while they're dealing with, you know, <laughs> someone calling out on a random Tuesday morning? You know, can they, can they, you know, handle all that? So we we trained project managers from within while we expanded the remainder of our roster to kind of support backfill behind them. Right. And my suggestion would be if you're if you're kind of in the throes of that, take it, take it slow, find, you know, all of the things that you do. We, we did this thing called, we call it a block Gantt. So anytime we would sell a project, we'd have this project, you know, 12 week project, every single week, there was a block of what is happening. And you think of it in terms of tasks, you know, you got demo, then you have uh, framing, you got MEPs, drywall, uh, paint, cabinets, trim, all the way through the process. We figured out, okay, what, what are the next, what's the low hanging fruit here? What can we find who who can we find to help do one of these things to take that off our plate? You know, we started right. with, can we find a good demo and framing crew? And then we were looking like, okay, can we find a good cabinet installer? So every time we would expand the roster, it was one less thing that my internal teams had to physically be on site to do. 
which meant that we could then manage that and do three of those at the same time versus just one of those at the same time. So start small, figure out what the low hanging fruit is before you're kind of jumping all in with, okay, we're project managing now. Everything is subbed out because that'll spook anybody. Uh, it'll right. spook a business owner or any you know of your existing side supers. Like, what are we going to do about quality at that point and you know why, why don't we hop into that so obviously growing a growing a company resource allocation is big part of resource allocation figuring you know putting the right people in the right spots is maintaining quality through the entire uh to, through the entire project this is probably one of the biggest thing biggest questions i get i imagine tim this is probably one of the biggest questions you get is like how do you maintain quality when you're hiring all subs and you're you're doing you know eight million dollars worth of work, and you're doing you know fourteen projects at a time. How do you how do you make sure quality stays up? And let's talk about quality from a craftsmanship perspective, as well as quality from the customer experience perspective, because both go hand in hand, right? Yeah, to 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 the a big degree. Although I think um, you know there have been people with great customer reviews, and when you look at their work, you go like, what? How? how could they have passed this thing, you know? So it doesn't always go hand in hand, but it tends to. So what I tend to emphasize with people, and here it is, checklists, pictures, training, how, whatever you want to want to call it. I think one of the best tools you can use for quality control is having a base for what quality is. And so when you tell a framing contractor, look, you got to do a quality job. What does that mean? When, you, when you're talking about installing cabinets, we want a quality job. What does that mean? Tile. What does it oh mean? <laughs> you know, what, you know, there's so many different standards. And so one of the things that I've been recommending to people is that they start putting together a quality control book of pictures. Now, as I was prepping for this webinar this morning, I was thinking like, why can't there be a spot like in in job tread where all of that information is housed so anybody on a job site can go look and go like, ah, that's what tile's supposed to look like when I'm when I'm done with it. You know, so there's like a like an art gallery of quality control standards within a software program so that people can compare the work that's done. Uh, to that. The the other thing is just second set of eyes. And this is a no brainer. Everybody knows this, but I'm going to tell you something. As you grow, you're going to get the call from the sub that says, Hey, I'm all done. And you're going to go, great. Make sure you lock up the house. And then you don't go look right. Yep. And what happens? You get the call from the client. This is really bad. I can't believe you, your guy left this the way it is. Oh, I'll come right over. And sure enough, you look at it and what? You go, that's not quality. And so getting on site, second set of eyes, one of the things that some companies are doing with their software program is they're having their subs take pictures and upload them to the software program so that immediately you can see, like before they leave the job site, you can see if they've hit the quality standards that that we have, but somehow getting eyes on that, particularly before the client, because you don't want the client to have to be the policeman. And that's the one of the biggest challenges with the experience is if they start feeling like they have to watch everything and find the things that are wrong, then you've lost the client in and the experience. First time, they, so. first time they're the ones that point something out, then they basically assume that role and you will have you will struggle to get that role back. They will think that they're yes. the ones that have to point these yeah. things out. And, be and the they've been told, part. they've been th told through every media outlet that they have to be the one. And so you not only have to teach them they don't have to be the one, but you have to live up to that. So I really like uh, that. And then the other thing that I, I have seen, I do training on zero punch list and, you know, getting to the end of the job and not having a client defined list. And one of the things that people are saying when they're doing it is ongoing to do lists. In other words, in our software program, whatever ones you're using, 
and there's multiples, but there's an ongoing list of everything that has to get done. It, the chances are better that you don't miss something in there yes. in terms of quality control. And so those are kind of the ideas. I the, the picture book, although it's probably in technology at this point, second set of eyes, well, making sure that somebody really looks, you know, and then ongoing lists are, are just critical for this. Yeah, um, so we're, we're going to bounce all over this because I think all of these intertwine because they're all yeah. very important. So um, second pair of eyes, documentation. Um, goodness, we we saw that a lot of the pass off from the office to the field, although we were documenting our plans really well, uh, things were getting missed because we would get so far into a job and all of a sudden, you know, tweaks were made along the way, which is it happens every single job. Right. Uh, but field tweaks were made uh, and all of a sudden the designs aren't quite going to be what the customer expect. Or perhaps there's just some complexity that wasn't originally understood about certain things. So we we came up with this uh, job gear. We we called it the job gear because it basically everything kind of fit in with, uh, with each other. And, and in this job gear, we have specific walkthroughs that happen and on every single job our production team is involved in three walkthroughs there's the pre-construction walkthrough which is imperative mm -hmm. we do a 50 percent walkthrough which is you know typically around just before or just after drywall uh, on most mm -hmm. jobs and then we have a 90 percent walkthrough the entire mm -hmm. time through uh, all of these uh, walkthroughs, we are documenting everything. The pre-com walkthrough has a checklist, things that have to be gone over. Is everything in your folder? Do a, do a check. Make sure that you've got all of the specs, all the, uh, you know, go over lighting. Like your rough ends only going to be 10 days from now. So make sure you know if there's three pendants going over the island or did that change? 50% uh, right. walkthroughs are really where we get the designer back involved, where the designer's coming back out to the site, going over all the finished details. The designer didn't really have anything to do with framing this bulkhead in a certain way, right? Other than making sure elevations are key. But we're going over tile layouts. We're going over, how does this, how is this going to work with the range hood now that we have, you know, this, this bulkhead over here? Tweaks and changes can be made in that 50% walkthrough that can't be made after the countertops are in and backsplash is going up, right? If we have to change the layout of the tile to work better with the electrical layout, all of those things can be discussed then. We we have these processes documented very thoroughly. And then the 90%, I love when you talk about the the no punch list uh, method. Are you actually speaking about that at JLC this year? Uh, no, but it's in the no. record somewhere that I've okay. done it so many times. But, I've got to uh, pull yeah. that one back out for for my crew to kind of sift through that because that's actually really good. We're trying to get there are two there are two podcasts on the Tim Fowler show that are zero punch, and so those are both really really good. We I will go back and find them, and I'll include them in the resources as a follow up to this webinar. Yeah, yeah, because it's great. We're, after we do a 90% walkthrough, um, that's where we create a Google Doc and the pass off actually goes to our production coordinator. She is making sure that everything is there on site that like we're missing one piece of hardware that ultimately we would have missed until we were ready right. to kind of get to the end. And that's what would have ended up on the punch list. Right. right so right. documentation is key. So, transparency with customers, all of that. So this is a great example about... Um, how when businesses grow, process has to change. And so you're talking about three walkthroughs, right? Mm -hmm. Now, if I'm doing a $1.5 million job that's taking a year to get done, I'm doing more than three walkthroughs. Yes, you are. <laughs> right? And, and Right. And so here, here's the key. We can get fixated on this is the way we do it. And this is another challenge in the growth process. This is how we do it. And then all of a sudden your jobs are now 50% bigger and you're only doing it the way you did the smaller jobs, you're gonna have trouble. So as companies grow and develop, they have to start thinking about how should our process change to incorporate a different model for, for the project. And so looking at it, Again, this is something I notes I jotted down is we kind of get stuck and we're playing catch up. 
you know, sales is selling, we're producing, but we're still producing in the same model that we produced when we were much smaller. And we can't do that. We have to always be thinking about what has to change in the process for us to be able to do the do twice as much work as we were doing before. Is and it a person? I, is it a process? Is it something we have to do? And I hear it all the time. You know, people talk about process and systems uh, at every conference we go to. And, <laughs> right. Uh, you know, it's a topic of a lot of uh, conversations. And ultimately, my biggest piece of feedback is document it, write it down physically, not just up here, not just in conversation, physically write it down. My office yeah. told me the, uh, you know, the flow chart guy, because I was always putting together flow charts, <laughs> but I cannot emphasize this enough in the consult, uh, in the, in the consulting work that I've done is that you have to document it. And, right. you know, one thing that we hear all the time from, especially our field guys is, well, that works on paper. Well, honestly, if it works on paper, it should work in real life. Now, granted, there are exceptions to that rule. Understand that. However, why do we have blueprints so that we can set off on the right foot, right? We can get the foundations laid in the right spot. Now, granted, there are tweaks along the way. However, if we have a documented process, something that we can reference, we know what we're supposed to be doing. Everybody right. knows what they're supposed to be doing. So that way, whoever didn't write it the first time, even if they're coming in late, onboarding new employees, understanding what they're supposed to be doing, there is a process that's documented that can tell them this is how we do it right and we're always changing these like you said you got to be willing to you know kind of flex around sometimes larger jobs we have weekly huddles where we're meeting the homeowner on site right. every single friday but technically right. we do you know 26 walkthroughs on that job right but, right uh, ultimately just document everything write it down um you know we you know you know aj you know what it means when somebody from the field says that works well that works good on paper it means you don't know what you're talking about. <laughs> oh, man. Yeah. <laughs> so, um, yeah, I, I wanted to kind of expand on on what you're saying, because documentation and process is is super critical and controlling that process. And we started into the customer experience a little bit. But one of the things that I've seen and I've done a lot of research on this over the last several years, because I'm going to stop saying customer satisfaction and start saying customer experience because that's what they care about. They care about how they feel in the project, not necessarily what we do in the project. And that's what's really, really key. But what I see is that when companies control the process and, and do the process all the way through, clients typically have a better experience when they when we allow the client to seize control somewhere then the experience erodes but the contractor gets blamed so for example getting selections done in a timely way sure i would love to have everyone done before we start every job i don't think that's going to happen but who controls that process? Do we allow the client to say, no, I can't do that. I can't get that selection made by Friday because I'm going to Europe, right? Well, what's going to happen? It's going to delay the job. The schedule is going to erode. The client's going to come back from Europe and say, how come you're not on schedule? Uh -huh. And when you try to say, because you didn't pick fault. the <laughs> blank, they say, well, you should have what, right? You should have told me mm -hmm. you should. And so the idea is get a process working and control that. And I think in our pre pre webinar notes, you asked me to kind of look for an example of that. And there's a, a, a an excellent company just outside of Boston. And when you talk with them, it's obvious that they say, yes, we can do this, but this is the way we do it. And they control, they do million dollar projects in downtown Boston, but they have a great way of telling their clients, here's the way it is. One of the things is that if a client doesn't make a decision in the right amount of time based on the schedule, they get charged. The client gets charged for not making decisions on time. 
Now, how many of us have the guts to do that? <laughs> so not not us, uh, but we do something similar, um, which is, uh, I think, a little uh, easier, I think, for most is that if a client uh, does not have selections made when they're supposed to, it gets refunded to them. The actual allowance item will get refunded to them so that we're no longer in charge of supplying and sourcing and then installing that particular fixture. That would end up on a change order. And ultimately, uh, one thing that we found is that they would drag their feet on cabinet hardware uh, often. They want to see the cabinet yeah. in place before they just make the decision. And we had a couple of jobs, one after another, not make that cabinet hardware selection until the job was done. We were ready right. to get paid, but they wouldn't issue the final check because there was no cabinet hardware on the cabinets. And now it's in right. our contract. And right. It's right. contract at that point. So we have to get that done. So we said no more. After 50% walkthrough, no more change orders and also no more selections. Anything that is remaining, you're going to get refunded on and you have to hire us back to do it under a separate contract. You know, whether it can be a change. Now, we're not we're not hard asses all the time on that stuff. We will make concessions and say, OK, we're glad that that kick in the pants got you to actually make that selection and ultimately we'll get it in. But it's a good way for us to actually lop that off and have it not hold up that final payment if it is the customer that is dragging their feet. One of the uh, one of the questions we have here: What are the best ways to handle uh, schedule disruptions? I think that is a uh, that is a meaty topic. But yeah. one thing that I've always been told: um, it's a great uh, business uh, mentor out of Philly that I have who says, "Do not let anyone control your schedule, but you." Not right. your contractors, not your employees, and not your homeowners. Your schedule is your schedule. And again, that works on paper, right? For the most part. I think there are two parts that I usually talk about, and, and I'll just leave this here maybe for follow-up, is there are the uh, the imminent things on your schedule that you have to get in front of and, uh, and handle, and then there is all the tertiary things. Good systems will help you with all managing all those tertiary things. If you have a schedule disruption, let's say inspections, right? That's the that's the one thing we can't control. You have an inspector that pushes a job back by a week. There's a lot of imminent things that you have to get in front of. Again, it's a topic for another day. There's some tricks that we have. But all the tertiary things, you, you, you've you got bumped schedules now. You've got bumped deliveries. Um, you've got subcontractors that have to be notified that their schedule is getting messed up. Really good systems, really good Gantt counters and job tread, uh, tying subcontractors to those things can help offset the load of scheduling, uh, you know, disruptions as long as those are in place. So I'll, I'll hopefully that answers that question uh, <laughs> pretty well. So it's it's eleven forty six, and we haven't really talked about this a whole lot. Okay, but uh, let's talk about technology in this. You know, I, I kind of just bridged that uh, kind of segue into this conversation by saying good systems, right? Job Trek can really help with Gantt calendars and and so on. But technology in the space, Tim, uh, any uh, leading thoughts on how to incorporate technology to help production teams thrive uh, from you before I maybe make a couple of suggestions on my own? Okay, so um, first of all, I think we're in the transition uh generation here because we've still got a lot of folks my age maybe a little bit younger that were not raised on computers not raised on technology we do enough for us to get by but we don't you know just dive in and then we've got the new generations coming in that they're doing computers they're doing technology and so forth like that so uh, but it's coming. It's here. We've got uh, we can embrace it. And I think the great thing about technology is that it it allows you to track information real time, uh, putting it into a program like like job tread. You know, it's there. It's real time. Now, it still depends on a human being making sure that it's accurate. You know, I, maybe artificial intelligence will take over someday and read our minds and automatically make things happen. But that doesn't happen. It still, it still takes a human being to make things happen. Um, so there's the availability. There's the, um, the details that are there. There's the communication part of it that allows 
like emails to be sent automatically that kind of alert people that, you know, there's work to be done or there's a schedule to adhere to, you know, those kinds of things. And so technology is going to be a bigger and bigger player. My main frustration with technology is that business owners are still expecting their field crew to access programs like job tread on their phones. And this is almost impossible, if not way more time consuming than just opening up a book and reading a piece of paper. And so I'm getting the feedback, give them tablets, give them something that will allow them to look at things quickly and in larger scale, but also keep the plans on paper <laughs> because paper plans are so much easier to look at and absorb than especially on a phone, but even, you know, you can even, easily draw on them, you know, even a tablet. Uh, now I did have this really bizarre idea. Now, if anybody does this, I get some of the money, but we need a tablet that will project on a wall, you know, and so we can open up the tablet and project the plans up on the wall. You can get you can get uh, project mini projectors. There's they sell them on Amazon that will connect to your iPad or connect to your laptop that can See, project just, I, up I, on the wall. But that would be that would be a way too that you could keep it all in the technology world, but it would still be big enough where you could see it. You know, and project management and software, well. you know, project management software uh, overall, I guess the feedback for uh, perhaps job tread and builder trend is the mobile app uh, experience, at least the UX design for, uh, you know, our employees out in the field. We need to make it as simple and easy for yeah. these guys, uh, you know, to be able to access information right. when they need it. I think job is doing a pretty good job on, uh, you know, they don't have a mobile app. It's just a, an app. Uh, or sorry, it's the web page that you can save as a uh, as an app on your phone. Uh, so their web app actually functions uh, much better than some of the other ones that we've seen. But I think uh, quick and easy information, getting job logs done from PMs or uh, guys with carpenters on site, like you said, that helps with quality control. Good communication with homeowners uh, helps with the customer experience. Just latch on to what you said there uh, was the customer experience over the customer satisfaction, they may yeah. be satisfied in the end, but that is not what they remember. They're not going to remember this beautiful kitchen. They're going to remember That's exactly right. what took them to get that beautiful kitchen. And if what took them to get to that beautiful kitchen was just pulling teeth to get information about the schedule and their carpet getting ruined and like they didn't know who was coming or going and the project took three weeks longer than it was supposed to, they remember that. Yeah. Right? So it may be it may be because I'm part of that older generation where face to face communication is is still really important. But I, my belief right now is that, yes, uh, you know, an automatic alert to a trade contractor that you're due on the job Friday at, you know, at eight o'clock. But I still like the conversation that says, hey, Bill are you ready? You know, we had a little shift in the thing over here. Just wanted to make sure you're aware of that. Are you going to stay till you're done? You know, just that personal communication. So I love the technology because it, it makes some part of this a little easier, but I still think this is a people to people enterprise, the clients, trade contractors, and then employees. And so I still think that personal communication is a is a very high value to everybody. I, I do think uh, you're not wrong there. Personal, uh, the personal touch uh, is definitely key. It's a relational type of uh, transaction, right? Between us right. and a homeowner, we're, we're affecting their home and we're hanging out with our kids in our house. Yeah. Uh, but in the end, I think for us, uh, we saw a, a dramatic need for document documenting communication. Yes. So having the communication go through a platform like Job Tread gives our uh, guys in the field and even um, in the office the ability to communicate directly with the homeowner, have it documented so that way they can't come back and say, nobody nobody told me this. Right. right. Well, no, actually, if you look here, we did. You know, mm -hmm. we, we did tell you actually twice. You know, yeah. it's helpful to have that <laughs> documented. I think someone latched on to your, uh, your AI uh, comment <laughs> here. Um, do you see chat GBT being helpful in the field for any purpose? I... Uh, I absolutely do. Uh, I love talking about this. I don't know, Tim, if you have any 
uh, thoughts on it, but you know, I just barely know what it is. And I, (laughs) you know, maybe there'll be a time when I'll uh, embrace it wildly. My, my successor, Greg Wallach at Remodelers Advantage is very much into it and has has a lot more experience with it. So it's conversational uh, searching like Google, right? But it's conversational, which, which means that you can basically say, hey, I'm struggling here. I need to find this. Yeah. Um, you can use it for building training manuals or putting outlines together for SOPs. Uh, you can help. I did this last week. I, I took two emails that came from two different sources. One was one of my employees. One was from a subcontractor. They were telling me two different stories. And I these were dissertations, right? These were emails. <laughs> for this. I'm like, I do not have time to read this. I literally dumped both emails into ChatGPT and said, hey, give me some pointers on uh, what is being discussed here, who's saying what, and suggested outcomes, right? And literally, it gave me bullet points. This person really has only these three problems. This person has these two. Here's some suggestions on how to respond to this. Granted, I'm not a robot. So of course, I'm but it it gave me some feedback to like, okay, this is really important. I really should get in front of this. Uh, but one of the biggest things, I hope everybody hears this, chat GBT, uh, the more robust like desktop uh, apps that you can buy, um, codes. If you need interpretations on codes, has the IRC in there, you can say, hey, can you explain uh, this particular IRC definition? You can you can say, hey, look this up. What are what are the strike plate uh, or sorry, what are the what are the, what are the nail plate recommendations for uh, you know a, an exterior wall when I've got electric running through it? You can ask it for sizes of nail plates, and it'll instead of having to thumb through a book or like try to find the right spot on Google, just ask it. It's like, hey, here you go. So that, here, that's, here. Super it's that's super value. Incredible, incredible. Yeah. It's like. The best thing since sliced bread is when I've discovered that ChatGPT was <laughs> worth more than just my kids asking it to like come up with a funny story or tell it jokes, right? Right. Uh, it's been uh, it's been a huge asset for the field. So yeah. uh, that 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 right there is worth every every bit of it because finding code answers is very difficult uh, a lot of times because you're not asking. Most of us don't ask the question that's obvious. We're asking for that little thing that is, you know, really hard to pinpoint. So that's really oh, yeah. cool. You I can like use that. ChatGPT for a lot more than production too. And we'll get into that yeah. probably in the next two webinars. Hey, I, I sense a podcast coming on. Hey, maybe. Yeah. Let's, uh, let's, <laughs> let's talk. I, that's a topic that every, I mean, everybody's asking. Right? Yeah. The AI coming from my job. I'm and writing it down. down. There you go. Awesome. Do I, wait, hold on. Do I get royalties for that one? <laughs> No, there's no money involved at all now. <laughs> um, wait, we're not getting paid for this today. Uh, so it is, uh, it is just a couple minutes to the hour. So I'm going to uh, basically use the last couple minutes here uh, to kind of like climb off of this this topic here and say that there's obviously we touched the surface on a lot of things. Uh, one of the biggest uh, comments that you know we we talk about are like when you want to grow your remodeling business, what's the best way to do it? Do you expand horizontally? Do you expand vertically? When I say that, I mean, when you're expanding horizontally, do you just, I'm going to go from one and a half to 3 million. Do I just double my team or do I grow vertically where I, I enhance my team, right? I'm getting better knowledge, better education. I'm promoting from within. So any last minute comments on that, how like, Promoting from within, there's a lot there, Tim, that you've you've talked about uh, in the past. But last minute comments on on that piece there, because I know you're a team guy. What what's your thoughts on education, growing, promoting? Uh, what would you what would you leave us with on that? So the I think the big thing for me, and for particularly for business owners, is that. I believe you need resources in your life that will help you think about these things uh, before it's too late. And so, uh, again, just a quick thing here. I work for Remodelers Advantage now. I've been associated with Remodelers Advantage for years and years and years, even before I worked full time for them. But having a network of people, and it could be another network 
uh, if you want, but having a network of people where you can ask these types of questions because they're going to give you uh, insight into what you're, what's going on, both their experience and what they've, uh, what they've seen in other, other people. So I would encourage that. But again, the idea I think is if you're taking time, maybe every other week, maybe, maybe once a month, but I'm feeling like that's a little bit too much time to literally stop and say, What's going on? What are some of the things I might run into in the future that are going to cause me problems? If you just take time out of your schedule to work, cliche, on the business, but instead of just sell, 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 deal with this problem, deal with that problem, you know, take care, hire that, you know, all that stuff is the day-to-day -day stuff. And what happens is we get caught when a, when a problem really happens that, could have been thought about ahead of time. And so take some time out of that busy, busy day on a regular basis, block it out on your calendar yeah. to look ahead and see what, what you need to do to prepare for six months out, a year out, that sort of thing. That would pick be my advice. Up. Yeah. Pick your head up, look around. Peer review groups are great. I spent uh, some time with RA yeah. Before I jumped into software, uh, a great group of like-minded individuals that are very intentional about growing their business some have gone before you. You can ask questions. It's great to get uh, feedback from people that understand the industry. A lot of great resources that come out of RA as well from, you know, accounting resources and uh, marketing advice. So uh, I would encourage everybody to check out uh, RA as well, Remodelers Advantage. Yeah. Um, you know, trade shows, um, you know, conferences that have education pieces tied to them are really great just to, again, meet with like-minded individuals, um, have a happy hour with, you know, a couple other business owners, commiserate a little bit, but also talk about like, hey, I've got these plans to grow. What do you think? Uh, it's great to get feedback from from industry people. Uh, so, uh, so, Tim, how can people find you? I mean, uh, okay. Just Google the name, right? Yeah, it's pretty, it comes up pretty fast. Although there's a, a professor of hogology in Iowa and a, uh, a now retired uh, Navy captain with the same names. I think he was in Japan, but uh, yeah, Tim Fowler, the Tim Fowler show, Tim at remodelersadvantage.com. Uh, I'm pretty, pretty available. So I'd love to hear from people. And uh, I will say if, if you got ideas for the podcast, let me know because uh, I love having people and, and I learn every time I do the podcast, I Man. learn something much like uh, we're all learning stuff today. Yeah, big time. Well, Tim, I really appreciate uh, the time here today. There are a, a handful of questions that I did okay. not get to that I will follow up in an email to everyone with a couple of these just to make sure no question went unanswered. Um, Tim, there might be some in here that I'm going to ask you to to hop in as far as... Uh, okay you know, do your PMs assist in the sales process? Because that's, uh, that's actually a really good one. Um, so we'll, we'll follow up with some of these questions after I'll make sure I send follow-ups with my contact information, uh, and some links for the next two webinars. Again, our next one's going to be on, uh, marketing and, uh, the one following that's going to be more on like sales process, business development, uh, and really establishing the organization and ready, uh, to, to get it ready to grow. So thanks for your time, everyone. Uh, Check us out, render.com, Tim Fowler Show. Uh, you know, we're in the industry. We're kind of all over the place. We'll both be at JLC uh, up in Rhode Island in March. So uh, let's, sure. let's let's connect. So thanks again, Tim. I appreciate Alrighty. the time today. And uh, I'll catch up with everyone sometime in the near future here. Take care, everybody. Bye, guys.